everyone and welcome! Last time we had a look at Noxus as a city. We learned about its leadership, its motives and its people. But now we will get into specifics. So let's have a look at Swain, the Noxian Grand General. Born into a patrician family, one of many to exist since the first walls were raised around Noxus. Jericho Swain seemed destined for a life of privilege. The noble houses had played a key role in Borem Darkwell's rise to power, stoking rhetoric that their proud heritage was the nation's greatest strength. However, many hungered for greater influence, plotting against Darkwell in a secret cabal united by nothing more than the symbol of a black rose. Uncovering their intrigue, Swain personally executed the most prominent conspirators. Among them were his own parents, whose whispers of a pale woman had first alerted him of the dangers to Noxus, which he valued more than house or kin. They sought a power, a shapeless voice crackling in the darkness of the immortal bastion, something like a raven's call. For exposing the Cabal, Swain was granted a commission in the Noxian army, far from anything he had ever known. There he learned firsthand that the Empire was not strong because of Noxians, as he had believed, but because of the way it could unite all men in spite of their origins. On the front lines, a foreign slave could be the equal to a highborn noble. But still, Swain found only darkness in the wake of each battle. Clouds of carrion crows. After securing the western borders, Swain's own reputation was secured in Shurima. There his forces raised countless Noxtora above the desert sands. Yet, in time, it became clear that greed was the sole purpose driving the empire forward. Fighting wars on too many fronts, lusting over magical relics, the aging Borem Darkwell was clearly growing unhinged. When Noxus invaded Ionia, Darkwell began to move even more brazenly, retasking entire warbands to scour the land for anything rumored to extend a mortal lifespan. With Swain's forces depleted, it became nearly impossible to engage the enemy. Finally, at the Battle of the Placidium, after luring the local militia into what should have been a trap, Swain's warhost was overrun. His veterans were routed, and Swain was gravely wounded. His knee shattered, Ionian blades cleaving through his left arm. As he lay on the verge of death, a raven approached to feed, and Swain felt an old familiar darkness press upon him again. But he would not let it take him. He could not. Staring into the bird's eye, he saw reflections of the evil strangling the heart of Noxus. A black rose, the pale woman, and her puppet emperor. Swain realized he had not defeated the Hidden Cabal, and they had betrayed him to what should have been his death, after seducing Darkwill, the man they failed to overthrow. All this was glimpsed, not in the mind of a raven, but something more. The power his parents had been seeking, the demonic eyes blazing in the dark. Cast out of the military for his failure, considered nothing more than a cripple, Swain set about uncovering what truly lay within the immortal bastion, an ancient entity, preying upon the dying and consuming their secrets, as it had attempted to consume his own. Swain stared into that darkness, seeing what even it could not, a way to wield it. Though his meticulous preparations took many years, Swain and his remaining allies seized control of Noxus in a single night. Physically restored by the demon, he crushed the Dark Will in full view of his followers, leaving the throne shattered and empty. Swain's vision for the future of Noxus is one of strength through unity. He has pulled back the Warhose from Dark Will's unwinnable campaigns, and with the establishment of the Triferix, ensured that no individual can rule unopposed. He embraced any who will pledge themselves to the Empire, even the Black Rose though he knows, in secret, they still plot against him. Gathering knowledge as the demon did before him, Swain has foreseen far greater dangers lurking just beyond. However, many Noxians secretly wonder if the darkness they face will pale in comparison to the dark things Swain has done. The sacrifices are only beginning for the good of Noxus. He arrived in the camp only moments before the strategy council was to begin, 
flanked by small honor guard, each handpicked from the Trifarian Legion. They remained at the entrance as I watched him approach. Some men cast shadow greater than themselves, but few could bring a darkness such as this, one that circled above us and hungrily caught. In a way, the ravens that seemed to follow him around the camp were a grim reminder of every warrior's fate. The tethered cloth in their beaks a match for the state of our own banners. Yet, as he strode into the remains of the war tent, I realized I had not prepared myself for how truly mortal he looked. There was grey in his hair, framed by a crimson sky choking on ash. His battle-worn armor gave way to a functional coat, and he kept his arm tightly within its folds, as I imagined one of his lineage might. I smiled, for he was still, at his heart, a gentleman. He wore no signs of rank beyond the telltale scars of a soldier who had seen his share of bloodshed. There were many gathered now for the council who demanded more fear and respect, swaying their war hosts with powerful displays of strength. Each of them seemed more than capable of breaking the man before us. But somehow, this was the man who led us all, the Grand General of Noxus. Looking at him, I could feel there was something I could not place, no matter how closely I looked. Something truly unknowable, perhaps. Perhaps it was because there was something unknowable about this man that so many flocked to his side. Whatever the draw, Jericho Swain stood before us now, and it was far too late for me to turn back. Five warhosts had marched onto the rockruined plain, but it had been only a matter of weeks before the locals had shattered our positions. They blasted through our hastily constructed berms with explosive powder, mined from the hills that seemed even more barren than those of home. Disaster had built upon disaster, until Swain himself had no choice but to intervene. I had made sure of that. For months I had prepared. I had sent war masons deep into the mines. I had mapped every detail, every conceivable twist of the land, and the fates upon which Noxus now balanced. The whispers that gave each moment shape. My ear itched at the memory of the pale woman's words, of the moment she first commanded me and gave voice to our plot. Everything was in place. I had accounted for it. Here, where the earth opened into a maze of canyons impossible to escape, I and I alone would determine the future of the Empire. After all, was that not what Swain had called upon this council to do? My trusted generals. Swain said finally. The power in his voice rang out like the drawing of a blade. He paused, as if giving us a moment to test ourselves against the keen edge. Tell me how Noxus may prevail. There are twelve warbarks here in the hills. Ledo began, pointing to a spot on the map already worn white by his attention, each drawn by a basilisk. Send them before the warbands and we'll be marching over the enemy dead. Those beasts would rot with a hedge of rusty spears if we let them. He smiled, pleased at his own cunning. But Swain was more concerned with the wine being poured into his glass. Will it be poison? His eyes seemed to ask as he peered around the table. I stared at my reflection in his armor. I would betray nothing of my intent. We can scarcely control the basilisks ourselves. Swain finally murmured, carefully regarding the fine Ionian vintage. Imagine even a single explosive dropped by a sapper within earshot of the beasts. And then tell me, in your imagination, who runs first, the basilisks with their tails between their legs, or your vaunted war host? We scorched the earth then. Myla petitioned before Ledo could respond, the words flying wildly from her mouth. Set fire to the pitch they've laid to burn on our advance. Drive them out of those damn mines. Swain laughed. We came here for the very earth you would burn though I suppose it is too much to expect you to know the uses of its saltpeter. He swirled the wine in his glass, betraying a hint of disappointment. All you have done so far is bury your own men with it. The red blades are still sharp. Jonet sped impatiently from the shadows where he lurked, the darkness seeming almost bright against his shuriman skin. We'll enter the mines after dusk, take out their leaders. Clean or messy, doesn't matter. An admirable strategy. <laughs> Swain laughed. But those leaders are not soldiers. Not yet. 
Our enemy here merely follows whomever bellows the loudest. Kill one, and there will be three bellowing by morning. I laughed, nodding to the frowning leader of the Red Blades. For a moment I was afraid you'd find a way for us to actually win, Jonet. Silence fell around the table. The candles were burning low beside the map. This was my moment. The pale woman would be pleased. I would say her name as I sent our Grand General to oblivion. The truth is, you cannot win this battle. I continued. No one can fight death. Not even the ruler of Noxus. Darkwill showed us that. Swain and the others watched as I carefully drew the flint striker from my tunic. The fuse line was already in my other hand. Ledo, aging hero of the Siege of Fenrath, bristled. Granth, what are you doing? He growled, glancing down at the crude demolition charge I had carefully positioned under the table, barely an hour before. You would threaten the Grand General. This is treason. Still, none of them dared to approach me. I held the striker over the fuse, ready. Except, someone was laughing. <laughs> it took me a moment to realize who it was. And there, General Granith is the only one who has the right of it. Swain chuckled, smoothing the wrinkles from his coat. He alone understands. The rest of you, you see a battle and ask what you must do to avoid defeat. But some battles cannot be won. Sometimes the only strategy is to burn. To change into the flames knowing full well you will die, but that 20,000 march behind you, and that behind them there is a greater power. He let his coat fall open. To reveal... To reveal... Granith and I... He said with a cruel smile. We always look for what must be sacrificed in order to win. Myla lunged for my trembling hands. Ledo, too. But it was Swain's inhuman grip that clamped me around my throat, hefting me from the ground, the unlit fuse forgotten. If only you could tell her yourself how you failed. The Grand General whispered, his voice rumbling with the wrath of eons. If only she too could heed the wisdom of the dead. I tried to scream then, to confess it all, to somehow beg for forgiveness. But there is nothing now save for the soft murmur of whispers. I spill my secrets, this tale, into your ears, fading like the rustling of wings as the raven cries its carrion call. And that was the story of Swain as we know it from the mind of Granth, a former Noxian general. I am a little bit sad that we didn't learn how Swain actually acquired the powers of the demon, but it seems like it may be explained later. Especially since we now know that other characters like Irelia may be involved in Swain's story. But even without that part, Swain was turned into an awesome leader who's secretly fighting another leader through politics. However, that wraps it up for this video. So if you enjoyed it, feel free to rate it and subscribe for more lore and news. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Discord if you'd like to chat. Our streams are now more frequent, so if you'd like to join ARAM, a lore battle or any other of our minigames, feel free to follow us on Twitch too. Links to merch and PO Box will be in the description. Of course, massive shout out to our patrons for going the extra mile. You guys are simply the best. And with that, thank you all so much for being here and for your support. You know, I really appreciate it. And as always, thank you, come again.